I'm going to start with uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement because uh, it seems like you know after so long this sort of passivity that, that you know something must have been bubbling, but there's this sense of passivity, and then everything exploded in 2011. And the reason I want to start with Occupy Wall Street is because I just thought uh, there's a, there's this great photo of um, of this young woman with a placard that to me sums up everything. It sums up the anger at, at the injustices of the system, uh, and it also sums up that sense of we know something is better is possible, but we just don't quite know what it is. Uh, the placard says, everything is fucked up and shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sums it up. Uh, so, yeah, there's this sense that we need something better and, and we don't quite know what it is. Uh, 2011, of course, also has uh, put revolution uh, back as a reality. It's something that exists now. It's not just a concept of, in the history books. Right across the Arab world, millions of people are right now involved in revolutionary activity. In Egypt and Tunisia, they've brought down uh, dictators, uh, and in other countries like Syria and, and, and Bahrain, uh, that revolution, you know, is still uh, going through those early stages of trying to, of top, of trying to top left dictator. Uh, in Greece, uh, a country where a few years ago you might not even have thought of this, uh, suddenly we have, you know, mass protests and mass strikes, uh, very, you know, certifiable class, certifiable class war, and at least. Well, in one of the opinion polls that was published in, in February, 33% of, of the Greek population now say they support revolution. Uh, it's an amazing, uh, staggering result. We can actually expect that to probably keep climbing uh, as the crisis uh, continues. The sense that there's something wrong and we don't quite know what to do. Uh, and what, I want to look, it sort of doesn't have to be that way. It's actually the solution's been there for a long time now. Uh, back 150 years ago, the founders of modern socialism, Marx and Engels, uh, actually identified uh, what the problem is, how we got here, how the world got into the you know, fucked up and shit state that it is, uh, and what the path forward has to be. Uh, they summed it all up in their famous call, the famous revolutionary call to action, workers of the world unite, you have nothing to lose but your chains, you have a world to win. And yet, as I mentioned, for a long time recently, in the last few decades, uh, that call for workers' revolution has seemed like some kind of relic, uh, something that was consigned to the past. I guess... I want, to, I want to start by asking them, well, what would this revolutionary world look like and why are the working class so important to it? In terms of that first question of what, what it would look like, there's some obvious answers. Uh, a better world would be one where uh, people didn't starve to death. Everyone knows these stats and if you don't, you should burn them into your memory. So today, 25,000 children starve to death. Tomorrow, 25,000 more will starve to death. Uh, and this happens... Uh, you know, the most obscene element of this is if that isn't obscene enough, is that that happens in a world where these children die surrounded by food. Every, every single uh, uh, survey on this, all the stats that come out of the UN show repeatedly that there is more than enough food to feed the planet. In fact, there's something like 3,000 kilocalories a day produced globally. This is enough for all 6 billion people on Earth to be quite fat. Uh, so there's no reason why anyone should ever <laughs> starve to death. In 2007, or between 2007 and 2009, 77 countries around the world uh, were hit by what they call food crisis. Uh, this meant that on top of the garden variety mass starvation that capitalism inflicts on us, we got a uh, ramping up of starvation. During that food crisis, uh, that, that meant an extra 150 million of us uh, were pushed into starvation. That was not caused by any lack of food. The, fu the food crisis of 2007-2009 was caused directly by... Bankers on Wall Street, financial speculators, uh, pushing up uh, the cost of food. Between, in, throughout 2008, the price of rice and grain around the world tripled in some countries. And, of course, no surprise, it was these countries uh, where people, the mass of the population, are least able to afford any kind of increase in food prices. At the height of that food crisis in 2008, global grain production was actually at record levels, the most grain the world has ever produced. So there's obvious problems. Obvious, you know, almost flippant answers about what the world would be like if it was better. You said, well, you just take the bloody food and you bloody give it to the starving people. You know, there's obvious answers, but it doesn't work that way, does it? So we need to think and be able to explain, you know, what the problem is in detail and, and, how, the, and how the working class can actually fix this. <coughs> now, capitalism has, at its core, an irreconcilable conflict between an exploiting class and an exploited class. The system is based on the existence of individual appropriation and accumulation, on one hand, and on the other hand, uh, social and collective, really, uh, production and distribution. In short, the mass of humanity works together to produce things that are sort of owned 
by that 1% of exploiters. We have no control over what or how or when we produce things, nor do we even own the things we have produced. Moreover, because the thieves at the top are pitted against one another, they have a direct interest in constantly increasing their exploitation of us. Now that conflict is right at the heart of the system. It can't be legislated away. It can't be regulated away. Uh, it's right there. At the, it, it is capitalism. That's what it, capitalism is. You can't, uh, you can't get around that. When workers organise then to defend their interests, even in the smallest, most everyday manner, they are actually challenging the rule of capitalists, even if they don't realise that that's what they're doing. At those times when the stakes are particularly high, workers' resistance tends to throw up new organisational forms that actually suggest a whole new way of running society, or a way of running society without, uh, without capitalists. Now, this has happened and again and again. It happens regularly throughout the history of capitalism. There's been plenty of examples over the last 150 years. I'll give you one from eight weeks ago. In February, uh, the 600 staff of Kilkis Hospital in Greece took a momentous decision. In the face of extreme austerity being forced on the population by the European capitalist class, the hospital, hospital's employees, so that's the nurses, the doctors, the janitors, the technicians, everyone, had a mass general assembly and uh, decided to figure out what to do. Now, Lena Zataki is one of those doctors. Uh, she's also the local district president of the doctors' union uh, and uh, explained the context in which this meeting took place. She says, the workers at the hospital of Kilkis and most hospitals and health centres around Greece are not paid on time, while many of them see their wages being slashed to practically zero. One colleague of mine was rushed to the heart clinic in a state of shock when he realised that instead of receiving his usual monthly cheque of 800 euros, that's the month, 800 euros a month, uh, he received a notice saying that not only was he not going to be paid for that month, but that he had to return 170 euros instead. Oh. Other workers were paid only 9 euros for the whole month. Yep. Oh. So that's the context that this meeting takes place, right? You picture this. It's a mass emergency meeting to decide what to do. So the workers responded by wielding the only power they have. They're not millionaires. They're not Gina Reinhardt. They can't just get on the phone to the Prime Minister and make shit happen. So they think, what can we do? So they have, on Sunday the 5th of February, the 600 workers, the workers had this meeting and they woke <coughs> and they took over the hospital. And they announced it to the world like this. The workers at the General Hospital of Kilkis answer to this totalitarianism with democracy. We occupy the public hospital and we put it under our direct and absolute control. The General Hospital of Kilkis will henceforth be self-governed and the only legitimate means of administrative decision-making will be the General Assembly of its workers. And they go on. Keeping in mind our social mission and the moral character of our profession, we will protect the citizens' health, providing free health care to people who need it. We call on our fellow citizens to show solidarity in supporting our effort. We call upon every mistreated citizen of this country to actively stand up against their oppressors. We urge our colleagues in other hospitals to make similar decisions. And we also call employees in all fields of public and private sector, members of labour unions and other progressive organisations to do the same. Until our mobilisation becomes a mass popular and labour movement of resistance and uprising, until the final victory against the economic and political elites that today rob our country and destroy the whole world. I hope you can see that's worth reading out in this. <laughs> uh, now, this is a bold move, obviously, and uh, unfortunately, the workers' control of the hospital only lasted a few weeks. It ended just recently. Uh, the government managed to reassert their control. But in that brief period, the workers of Kilkis Hospital have demonstrated to all of us again the way to win a better world. Their immediate struggle for their livelihoods also proved, I'm going to get through to the details of how they ran the hospital, but think about this, so they also proved something else here. Free universal health care is actually not difficult. Yeah. Like, despite all of the protestations of every government around the world that says it couldn't possibly be done, it couldn't, you know, there's no way, well, all of that was swept aside with the vote of workers who said, we're just going to do it. So, yeah, remember that next time. <laughs> so, in the end, if the occupation was going to survive, it had to spread. So, for example, the workers who deliver the supplies and the electricity to the hospital would also have to start providing that service for free uh, and would thereby face the same battle with their own employers, their own bosses. <laughs> the hospital staff knew this instinctively, as any workers who move into that kind of level of struggle do. Hence, part of that call, a big chunk of that call, was actually a call out for solidarity. They knew they needed support from outside the hospital. So how did the hospital actually function under workers' control for a couple of weeks? Well, the workers had daily meetings and regular general assemblies. They decided democratically what they would do with their hospital. They had to argue it out collectively. They had to decide democratically because that's the nature of their position. Uh, one person on her own can't operate a hospital. 
nor could they just break the hospital up into 600 parts and each of them takes 600 parts home and takes their part home and, and does something with it. In order for their power, in order for, their, in order for them to actually fight for their interests and try to defend their living standards, they had to occupy the hospital as the only tool they had. To do that and to run it, they have to work collectively, they have to work democratically. Wow. Um, if you think about that, that's a million miles uh, from the concept of what ownership means for the capitalist class. For them, think how they talk. They talk about dog eat dog, it's a rat race, it's a jungle out there, they have to compete to survive. Compare that to the slogans of the workers' movement. It's all about solidarity. We say injury to, injury to one is injury to all. Uh, unity is strength. Uh, the same dynamic is seen, has been seen every time that workers have moved into that sort of organised resistance. <laughs> If the struggle at Kilke's hospital had to actually, you know, had spread across the entire chain of production and distribution, then at some point they would have had to start organising across, uh, across, across workplaces. So not just in the hospital, they would have had to start coordinating uh, that struggle across different workplaces. And again, workers in the past have shown us examples of how that can operate. One, uh, oh, one key example from history comes from the workers' uprising in Poland in 1980 to 81, uh, where workers from over 200 uh, we start in the city of Gdansk where workers from over 250 striking and occupied factories uh, joined together to form the Inter-Enterprise Inter Strike Committee with delegates from each of those striking factories elected. Uh, now that strike committee, that example of the strike committee rapidly spread across the whole country. So every major city then had these Inter-Enterprise Strike Committees and eventually they united to form what became known as Solidarność. It's known in history as the Independent Trade Union. That's what they called themselves. When you look at what happened in Poland, this strike committee, because it had control over all of the productive apparatus of Polish society and was able to decide you know, what was produced and what was running and what was operating and was doing so democratically, this became essentially a seat of alternative power opposed to uh, the Polish state. And it survived that way for 15 months until the Polish state cracked down. Now, there was changes going on uh, in Polish society that, uh, at the time, that in the most minute level of how ordinary people relate to each other. Andrei Bida, Andre Bida, who's a uh, Polish filmmaker, made a series of great films about the resistance, uh, which I recommend, but he, he, he made this one observation about the move in the Gdansk shipyard while he was there. He says, uh, there was an impression of calm, calmness, coolness, festivity, something lofty and something extraordinary. Um, that was just in Gdansk, but by the time that Solidarność had sort of spread around the whole country, uh, there were these, these changes being reflected all over the country. Uh, a leading sociologist at the time uh, made the following observation. He said, much of the interpersonal, this is all very science speak, you know, much of the interpersonal irritation and aggressiveness has disappeared. People are being nice to each other. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah, we can laugh, right? Because under capitalism, it's not like that, is it? You know, we're pitted against each other. And you think about the, the, state, the state we find ourselves in, uh, those of us who are lucky enough to have work, spend most of our lives in what can really only be described as a dictatorship. Uh, we go to work, people who are never elected by anyone or accountable to anyone tell us what we do, what we wear, when we smile. Don't laugh at RMIT, they've got fair work ordering us right now, we should smile. Uh, so it really is, in, in a sense, a dictatorship. They're not acting like psychopaths, well they are like psychopaths, but they're not acting like that because they're psychopaths. They're acting logically in the interest of pursuing profit. So once you remove uh, that, that element from the equation, you know, where profitability for some minority at the top is out of the question and we've got this workplace and we're going to decide what to do with it, everything changes. The way you relate to each other changes. It's no surprise that sociologist said, wow, people are being nice to each other because suddenly your comrades, you're not competitors. So, I mean, there's this fundamental change and that dynamic is reflected every time the workers move into revolutionary action. Um, we see examples of this even, even short of full-blown workers' revolutions. Today, in the Arab revolutions, Ordinary people have shown time and time again this ability to govern themselves. Uh, in February last year, in that little period uh, between the overthrow of Mubarak and the outbreak of revolution uh, just across the border in Libya, um, there's these amazing stories. One of the journalists for the English paper, The Telegraph, uh, uh, turns up in the revolutionary city of Tobruk and, and describes it as follows. He says, Cheerful chaos reigns. After 42 years of brutal dictatorship, no one seemed to be in control of anything, yet somehow everything, everyday life continued. The power was on, the shop floor was stocked, hospitals were open, and crime was not much worse than usual, even though the police force of more than a thousand had all deserted their posts. <laughs> Traffic direction had been left to ordinary citizens who took over at key road junctions. Every afternoon, thousands of demonstrators gathered into Brook Central Square, and they renamed it Tahrir Square after the one in Cairo, where they would spend hours chanting anti-Gaddafi slogans. <laughs> 
Now, what that slightly confused journalist was describing uh, kind of seemed new and exciting at the time. But when you scrape through the history, all of this has happened before. That description bears a remarkable echo of the description that the uh, novelist George Orwell made uh, when he turned up at the revolutionary city of Barcelona in 1936. And he said, It was the first time I had ever been in a town where the working class was in the saddle. Practically every building of any size had been seized by the workers and was draped with red flags or with the red and black flag of the anarchists. Every shop and cafe had an inscription saying that it had been collectivised. Even the boot blacks had been collectivised and their boxes were painted red and black. Waiters and shop walkers looked you in the face and treated you as an equal. Uh, the revolutionary posters were everywhere, flaming from the walls. And down the main street, the loudspeakers were bellowing revolutionary songs into the day and night. So you just see it's the same story. You know, We see the same things uh, repeated when the masses move into revolution. In Spain, the difference was... This was the working class had much more taken uh, the central position in that revolution. You know, Orwell identified that. He saw it. He said, "Oh, these waiters and the boot blacks and everyone." Um, okay, so mass revolutionary upheavals have a dramatic impact on the consciousness of those participating in them. Uh, if you look at the Arab revolutions, we, we we don't have to think hard to recall some of the scenes. There's the women and the children leading the revolution in Tahrir Square. There's the Christians and the Muslims defending each other while they pray. Uh, all of these mass changes that happened so suddenly, all the divisive ideas and the sense that uh, you know, the sense that some of us were better than others or whatever, all of this crap that has reigned for so long just literally falls apart once people move into revolution on a mass scale. In a revolution, all the ideas that we take for granted are up in the air. Everything is subject to radical change. The way we relate, the way we relate to each other, even in the most personal and intimate sense, is recast. This has, uh, you know, this, this has uh, deep significance because in a society that's cleft into classes like ours, uh, oppression is, you know, oppression and division is a central, a vital tool of the exploiting class. So for, for the working class to forge uh, the, the solidarity and the unity that's necessary for them to actually assert their power, they need to uh, challenge those divisions. They need to start to unite in order to actually further their cause. So that can play a vital part in challenging uh, divisions amongst people. But it doesn't end there, because a workers' revolution starts to challenge the actual, you know, the material basis of oppression itself. If you take women's oppression, for example, it's persisted uh, since the earliest days of class society, but the workers' revolution actually strikes at a death blow. And again, we can take a look at history to see this. Uh, as well as my, being my 10th anniversary uh, of, of being a revolutionary, uh, we're rapidly approaching the 100th anniversary of an even better event, which is the Russian Revolution of 1917. Uh, it can seem like a long time ago, it was before Facebook, but uh, the Russian Revolution and the strides that it made uh, for, for women's rights against women's oppression, starting to smash women's oppression, still stand as a beacon uh, for, those, uh, for those of us fighting for a better world today. Uh, in Russia, they implemented communal kitchens, in communal laundries, no fault immediate access to divorce, uh, abortion was legalised, education was brought in for largely literate women, uh, all of this stuff and much, much more. There's too much to even go into. Uh, and this was not handed down by some government. People didn't get this in Russia just by waiting for it. They seized it themselves. You know, the women working, the working class women of Russia started this process. The revolution started with them uh, rising up against their own bosses and against the Tsar. Uh, so this was won by the workers themselves. Uh, now, as I said, though, it wasn't just about particular policies they implemented. The workers' revolution starts to undermine the basis of women's oppression because it starts to challenge, starts to get rid of the, uh, the basis of class society. It starts to get rid of classes. Once the working class, I've got to explain this a bit, once the working class is overthrown, the capitalist state, uh, the real transformation of society begins. It, you can see how this works just by thinking about the process. So, of necessity, throughout the revolution, the workers will have established an institutional authority capable of directly challenging and then replacing the old state. We saw an embryo in that, of that in the example of Solidarność that I mentioned before, this, this organisation that's thrown up in the course of the struggle. That starts to become an alternative power. Now that body will have grown out of that struggle uh, and it links together workers across the country and eventually across, across borders, uh, but now after the revolution or after the insurrection becomes the new state itself. Its job then is to act to defend the revolution and to ensure, to ensure that working class rule is upheld. Now, in one sense only, are uh, the two states uh, in any way similar. You know, the, the, the capitalist state and the worker state that replaces them. They're only similar in a sense that they uh, defend, you know, they, they are there to uphold the rule of a particular class. In every other aspect, they are a million miles apart. This is important because the capitalist class are a class of minority uh, parasites who, whose power rests on exploitation. Right? They don't actually do anything. They're in power because they own everything and they can actually exploit the mass of, the mass of humanity. The working class 
Uh, well, that actually, that means something. That means that their, their rule, in order for them to maintain their rule, they have to rely on lies and oppression, and that at the end of the day, they have to rely on violence. The working class, by contrast, as the examples I've showed just recently, hopefully illustrate, is a class that is not uh, a small number of people pitted against each other whose power rests on exploiting and dividing people. Our power as workers rests on our ability to collectively act. In order for us to have any power at all, like our power is proportional to our ability to act together. So we're, this is why worker struggles always tend to be democratic. That tells us that the worker's state will be necessarily democratic and uh, you know, uh, expansively <coughs> democratic. It also tells us something else, though, not necessarily obviously, but the thing about the worker state is that it's actually transitory. This is the state that the, the revolutionary Lenin described as a state which is not a state. And so uh, what, what we're moving towards, then, is a, a state that starts to undermine the existence of classes uh, and starts to move towards a society free of class division. Now, the main, ta the main task of that new state is to keep down the capitalist counter-revolution, and one key element of that is to spread the revolution internationally. Once those tasks are accomplished, and actually we're yet to see any revolution get quite that far, although the Russians got quite, you know, got close for a little while. Once those tasks are accomplished, uh, in a sense, the worker state has undermined its own reason to exist, um, and it becomes the, the move towards a society of sort of self-governing uh, international, uh, you know, uh, uh, workers kind of communities. That sounds very grand, doesn't it? It sounds very grandiose, but actually, uh, again, we see. The, uh, the embryo of this, even in the revolutions that are happening today, particularly, for example, in the Arab world. Um, we'll get there in a second. Uh, because socialism will be uh, a world without war and imperialism because the rivalry between states will have, will have disappeared. The states themselves have been replaced with these democratic organs. The borders that divide, that currently divide these territories that are carved up uh, also start to disappear because basically they serve no purpose. But in the revolutionary process itself, uh, we start to see people on either side of a border actually challenging the existence of that border. Let me give you an example. So again, in that period between the fall of Mubarak and the, and the, and the uprising in, or the, immediately after the start of the uprising in Libya, uh, the, the Libyan Egyptian, the Libyan Egyptian border, which for most of us you know, the way the media portrays the revolutions in the Arab world, to the extent that they even talk about the Egyptian-Libyan border, they talk about it as this place where all of these refugees who were fleeing Libya got stuck because they couldn't get into Egypt. And they were stuck there in these squalid camps, fleeing from the carnage, you know, the, the, the war in, in Libya. It did end up this way, but it didn't start that way. This only happened after the uh, authorities on either side of that border. And these were not, you know, democratic workers' authorities. You're talking about SCAF, you know, the military dictatorship in Egypt and then the Transitional National Council, you know, back by NATO and Libya. Once this kind of order is re-established, the border is shut, is shut, is clamped shut again. But in these couple of weeks before that, amazing scenes unfolded. And again, we get these accounts from journalists who were there. So, so one of the journalists, uh, one of these English journalists reporting uh, uh, from, from the border says this. Uh, he describes... Uh, he, he, but first he notes that he's been a North African correspondent for years, and he's crossed borders like this countless times. Normally what it means is standing in queues for hours uh, while uh, you know, itchy-fingered uh, border guards you know, caress the finger of their AK-47 and, and eye off it and eye your passport and things. He says everything was different this time. Uh, the border itself had ceased to be a border in any practical sense, and the Libyan state had basically abandoned it. The Egyptian population in the midst of the revolution uh, on their side of the border supported the uprisings in Libya uh, and saw their own struggle for freedom inherently tied to their brothers and sisters across the border. So this border, which had previously been the site you know, of well, football violence, if you want to take a, you know everyday, violence, everyday example, football violence across there, people bashing each other, there had also been, of course, uh, military conflict across that border. Once the revolution broke out on either side, all of that melted away. Um, so uh, the number of journalists who report from this period, uh, who report from crossing that border, is staggering. One of them says, uh, uh, he crossed the border, all of the infrastructure was there, all of the deserted uh, guard towers, the boom gates were up, everything was still there, but it was all deserted. He didn't find any guards, but what he found uh, was two young Libyan men reclining on deck chairs. <laughs> He's crossing from Egypt into Libya. Two young men reclining on deck chairs, and as he approached, they stand up and they wave, and they said, Welcome to Free Libya. <laughs> Another journalist uh, reporting from the scene describes walking casually across the border uh, with an almost childlike flea. And he, said, he says this amazing thing. He says, Ha! So much for visas. 
<laughs> yeah, it's funny. But uh, in a country like this one, that makes this kind of ghoulish, uh, obscene art form out of locking up refugees, uh, that phrase alone, the fact that one person walked across that border and said, ha, so much for visas, that phrase alone, in my mind, is justification enough for revolution. Um, so, yeah, I guess what I... To, to try to start sum all this up, uh, the, paint, the picture that I'm painting, uh, it should go without saying, this is a million miles from the sort of stuff that we saw in all of these countries that called themselves socialist or communist. I'm talking about a world where work is not a dictatorship, where we decide who and what and how and when and where we will produce things, and we control it democratically. And if we need more stuff, whatever, we need to vote for it. You know, then none of this stuff. We've, we've all seen the situation where the boss tells you to work harder, and you say, well, no, we need more staff. And that's pretty much the end of the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> if we decide, you know, if we could decide things, that conversation would never happen again in the entire future of humanity. Uh, so a world, a world like that. But in a bigger picture, you know, we're talking about a world where we can just say, let's take the food and give it to people. You know, let's take the empty houses in America and put the record numbers of homeless people in them. Uh, you know, let's, uh, all of those decisions could be made. We're also talking about a world where the basis of all of the horror today is gone. There would be no basis for oppression if you don't have some parasitic minority who benefit from it at the top. You know, once control is taken out of their hands and put under democratic control of the mass of the population, the whole basis for those sorts of oppression uh, are gone. So we're talking about a world then that's free of racism, that's free of sexism. All of that stuff is undermined from the day that workers first take power. Now, uh, the important word here, I guess the key word in everything I've said, is the working class. That's why uh, the situation we're describing is so different, uh, so, million, you know, so many million miles away from anything that we've seen in these countries that call themselves communists. Mm -hmm. Forget about their big red flags, forget about, you know, fat people in military suits calling each other comrade. These countries had nothing to do with socialism because they never had the working class in power. These were not societies built by the working class. The working class is the only force that can actually win that type of world. If we want to know what a better world looks like, we have to look at the struggles of the working class today because we see, uh, we see the inklings of it. You know, if you want to know what it looks like, look at the Cookies Hospital. You know, it only lasted a couple of weeks, but what did we see there? We saw, you know, free health care. We saw people having pleasure, a pleasure, taking pleasure in going to work, deciding what they were going to do with their lives. Uh, I don't know the breakdown, the demographic breakdown of Cookies Hospital, but I bet you there would have been men, women, straight, gay, black, white, like, this is, you know, all of that stuff starts to get undermined through that struggle. Um, now, that struggle is here, it's underway, and it's not just happening in Greece. It's happening all around us. We're in it right now. Uh, Marxism, then, is not really a blueprint for a better world. We don't, we're not going to stand here. I don't have a projector, you know, and I'm not going to show you exactly the breakdown of how this world will run. What we have is an understanding about how the world got into the situation it is and what the way forward has to be. Marxism is a call to arms. It's a call to say, join the struggle in the fight against those forces in society that would keep a better world at bay. You know, these forces that actively <coughs> try to stop us uh, improving the world in even the slightest possible fashion. That's what Marxism is. It's not a blueprint, it's a call to arms, um, and that's where I'll finish.